Hello, John Coleman here today. Hope you're all well. I'm looking forward to um, sharing some thoughts with my good friend, Orm. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode number four of the TN Mortgage podcast. We're excited to go over a few things today with, of course, our host, John Coleman. How are you, Norm? Doing good. Doing what, have good. You, what have you got for me today? We have a lot of great stuff. Um, why don't we start off with your least favorite topic because you go over this so so much i know where you're going go on and it's my favorite topic because it annoys you so much the recap of the recap okay okay um well thanks very much i was hoping you'd forget that but uh, no 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 chance (laughs) um well for anyone who may have seen this um previously i apologize but just a recap of of the information or the thoughts that i put out at the beginning of april there on as to where we're at um at the moment from both the mortgage and the property market well in a nutshell summary at the beginning of this month the clocks have gone back there's more light in the evening and houses look better and ultimately what tends to happen is more houses come on the market as a result of that so if you if you are a frustrated purchaser looking to find a home and there hasn't been enough choice hopefully that will change um the next really, really important thing, and I've been um, obviously talking about this on a consistent basis, the rates went up again la- about two weeks ago with the central bank, um, European Central Bank. Slight difference in, in, in their commentary. Previously, they stated that they'd be going, rates would be going up again. This time, their comment was um, it would be looked at based on data, basically. So it's not mm-hmm. quite as concrete that they will be increasing rates yeah. again um as or as quickly the next time the fact that there's been a collapse of the silicon bank in the us and um credit suisse just might make them slightly more nervous and may in effect um put a little bit of pause on the the increase in rates but we will obviously keep you updated on that mm-hmm. i honestly still highlight to people that they need to keep view taking the view that rates will go up and to make sure they're comfortable with any repayments that they may have if that does happen okay yeah and without boring people completely um in the recap of the recap it seems very very long here norm by the way um, no no it's great the number great. of prop <laughs> the number of properties um on sale at the moment would be about thirteen thousand. that's up by 30 percent from last year which is a good sign but it's still well short of the twenty five thousand that would have been on the market at the pre-COVID in 2019. So mm. while rates are going up, my view is still maintaining um, that the prices will just, will, will won't fall. They'll kind of remain as, as it is. That's just my call on it at the moment. And finally, well, I don't like to won't dwell on this, but the service with the banks at the moment is still pretty um, ordinary, shall we say. So there is the recap of the recap. <laughs> All right, John. So we now have an interesting segment on the TN Mortgage Podcast where we research the top Google queries about buying a home or getting a mortgage in Ireland. So this is what people are uh, typing into Google the most, try to get some good information. And to make it easy for everyone, we're going to list the top ones and then you're going to give a quick answer to each. Okay. Thanks, Norm. Yeah. So we'll start with the, we'll start down the list a little bit. Um, but one of the, still one of the top Google queries is about the help to buy scheme in Ireland. Excellent. Well, yeah, that would be really understandable for first time buyers. The deposit is obviously crucial because you need to have 10%, but with the help to buy scheme for new properties only, you can get up to 30,000. It's based on the tax that you've paid in the last four years and for new properties only. So if it's 2023, you're looking at the tax you paid in 2022, 21, 20, and 19. Um, but that would be where to, to go to as a starting point to see how much you actually qualify for with the first, um, with the help to buy scheme. Great, great. Um, good answer there. I'm sure that'll help a lot of people. And with all of these, of course, you have countless blogs. Um, you know, you have an email campaign yeah, to educate people, videos on YouTube. So there's other resources for folks, but absolutely. Um, the next uh, one of the top Google queries about buying a home or mortgage in Ireland is about stamp duty rates in Ireland. Okay, well, that's quite a simple question to answer. It's literally 1% of the cost price. Um, 
if if it's a new property, it's actually one percent of the the cost price less the VAT on it. But your solicitor would um would would dictate exactly how much you have to pay on stamp duty. But as a rule of thumb, if you're buying a property for four hundred thousand, you're looking at one percent. You're looking at about approximate. You're looking at four thousand euro. Okay, great information. Um, and now we have a, a top, one of the top Google queries. Just uh, very simply, property prices in Ireland. Okay, well, you we, you could spend a whole half an hour talking on, on that. They have been going up, despite the so-called experts um, just at COVID saying the prices would fall. They have been going up since pre-COVID. Um, and my view, and I've stated this in a number of different places, is that even with rates going up, I don't see prices falling for the next 12 months because there's such a gap between supply and demand. Mm -hmm. So that would be my take. Um, and as things stand, I don't see that changing for the rest of this year. So prices had been going up with the rates as they were having going up. I think that's going to dampen what the bank are going to prepare to lend to people. So that is going to have some impact and the impact i expected to have is that prices will not run away with themselves but they won't fall either mm, yeah great information um and here's another uh, one you could spend a half an hour on simply a google query of mortgage rates in ireland oh well that's kind of related to what we just discussed there in terms of property prices the rates in ireland have been tradition have been incredibly low up until literally about four or five months ago that has changed based on what's happening in the world and inflation. And as things stand, rates are going up. And I am continually to tell people, factor in a 2% increase and see if you're comfortable with that repayment. And only then look at that as the kind of price range that you want to go to. Great. And uh, now we have, drum roll please, brrr, the number one all-time <laughs> Googled search query about buying a home in Ireland. How much can I borrow for a mortgage in Ireland? And you want a quick answer to this question, yeah? Um, <laughs> okay, well, to start with, the central bank, in theory, said banks could now lend for first-time buyers up to four times their salary, and for second-time buyers, it's three and a half. That four times is not a guarantee. It's based a guideline. So in real terms, until you, the bank will factor in your income, will factor in your age, will factor in the number of children you have, will factor in your any loans, what I would say is, in real terms, a maximum of what you can borrow will be four times your salary. Your salary then is broken down into the fundamental part. Is your basic salary is the most important part. Then they'll give you less allowance for any overtime, commission, shift work that you will be doing. So it's difficult to give you a precise kind of rule of thumb go-to, but maximum four times your salary. But it's a kind you you kind of need to be talking to someone either the bank or someone like ourselves to give you to give you an absolute figure on that you know yeah so that's one they should just give you a call or contact you much easier absolutely huh? yeah okay um sorry without being I'd like to be more precise um it's a, it's that's ultimately what we do is it provide that roadmap to answer that very question. <laughs> All right, John, now on the Tea and Mortgage podcast, we're going to go over something that's a big issue for a lot of people around the world, especially if they're an expat in Ireland or another country or sending money home or moving around, and that's bank transfers. And we've certainly had our own little recent <laughs> frustrations and experience trying to get some money from point A to point B. So uh, why don't you shed a little light on that topic? Okay, Norm. Well, you know, I'm always very good and very early in paying you for your wonderful services in terms of helping me um, become the marketing experts that are taking your marketing expertise on board. Um, and I've always been good at paying. And we tried to thought we'd find a way of doing this in a more efficient basis, right? So mm -hmm. um, getting, get, getting one bank account details and trying to make a transfer, international transfer. First attempt, thought it had gone, came back at me. Second attempt, I went into the bank firstly, came back at me. Third attempt, sat in the ether, still hasn't come back to me. Right? Oh, so, man. Um, it, it's been, now we have found, uh, we have, for anyone knows who's listened, we've actually found a way. You obviously weren't familiar um, until I brought it to your attention with Revolution. So that's how we've managed to make it happen. But even yeah. that required a bit of a tutorial in terms of helping you to um, be, be able to get the money from Revolution into yeah. your own bank account. But Hey, and maybe they a, can, a, maybe we have a new, uh, just jumping in, maybe we could have a new sponsor. Maybe 
they'll sponsor the podcast. So first we had the uh, the wings from your favorite restaurant there in Dublin, and yeah, now we have. Scouts. So I, yeah. I I ran that by them, by the way. It, it hasn't landed. I haven't got the decision from the committee yet. So. <laughs> but maybe Revolut, the uh, the bank transfer app, will be our second sponsor. Huh? Yeah, no, you never know. Um, but <laughs> I won't hold my breath on that, to be honest with you. But yeah, no. On a, on a serious note, for anyone listening, um, with regard to the mortgage and anyone that's um, sending money back home, right? The impact that that can have. Um, well, firstly, banks are always worried about what they call an ability to repay. Okay, so if they see money being transferred back home, whether it be transfer wise or whatever method, transfer wise seems to be the most popular that people use to actually send money back home, right? Um, the the worries the bank has is that there's other loans or other mortgages um, back at home. And that mm -hmm. ultimately would have an impact on what they would consider to be your ability to repay the loan that they're about to, to give to you. Okay. So mm -hmm. here's the kind of rules. In theory, some of the banks look, well, if you've been in Ireland for five years, they tend not to look for what they call a credit report. And an experienced credit report is what they tend to look for to prove that you have no um, loans back home. And can be a bit of a pain to actually get it to be honest and it's not that cheap so if they if you're here for longer than five years then they will definitely won't ask other banks some banks don't ask um but maybe they, their rates are higher so you might want the bank that does ask so mm -hmm. if they look this is the key thing if you're sending money back on a monthly basis well it asks the question straight away well why now a lot of people are sending money back to help family okay um, but once they see the money going back, they're going to look for this credit report. Um, so I would always tell people, get the credit report early so that it doesn't cause them a, a problem. Or stop sending money back home for a period of time. Maybe do it once and then wait. If they're, not, if they're planning to go for, look for a mortgage in six months' time, send a big lump at one point and then do nothing for the next six months. Mm -hmm. That kind of way um, might be one way around it. But it's... It's not, it's something that it causes, it's not a deal breaker, but it's a pain point, basically. It's, it's something that causes um, unnecessary grief or hassle. So um, I would advise people to order the report early, or if they had any hidden loans, make sure that they don't, um, are, are not making any transfers back home. Wow, great information. Yeah, and I know transferring money, just money. moving back and forth, um, sending money back home and to family, what have you, like you stated, is a massive industry. I mean, it's, you know, who knows how many hundreds of billions, if not more, it is every year. So doing it right and getting your bank accounts in order and, and these tips could really save you when you need to uh, buy a home and, you know, you move to Ireland and you're looking to get a mortgage and buy a home and even doing it incorrectly could disqualify you if your bank statements aren't in order. So that's another reason yeah. people should talk to you early. Yeah, the bank accounts are ultimately key and it becomes forensic. It's it's almost like they follow the money, basically. So if they see money going somewhere, they say, okay, where's that going? Okay, show us a statement for that. Oh, there's a loan you have there. Oh, tell us more information. So the cleaner your bank accounts are, the less problems you have and the easier it is for the banks to say yes, especially when you're coming from outside of Europe. They they can be a little bit more, um, I'm trying to find the right word, they can be a bit more forensic in, in the level of information and the level of detail they look for. Mm, interesting, yeah. And so hopefully when we do our, our next Tea and Mortgage podcast episode in early May, we'll have good news that my millions of euros, my payday has arrived safely in, through my app. Huh? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Thanks, John. All right, John, now on the Tea and Mortgage podcast, a lot of times when I email you, when I call you, we're interacting almost daily and you say, oh, I just got back from a squash match or I'm heading out uh, the door because I have to go play squash. And I know that's a big love of yours. So I wanted to hear more about that. Well, yeah, well, bizarrely, it's only a recent love. I used to play a lot of badminton and then a friend of mine mine was going for a game of squash and I played it when I was in my early 20s briefly and, and I enjoyed it and I went and played it and I I gave up badminton to, just to continue playing squash badminton mm. I was playing doubles squash is singles and, and I just got such a joy out of it now you laugh when I tell you 
that squash is not the game you you should be taking up in your in your forties. By the way, oh, okay, <laughs> it's it's not good on the knees. And it, my mother kept saying, John, will, you, "Will you just not go back and start playing golf? Will you? <laughs> it's a much healthier or less risk." So um, I've had a black eye. I had a, <laughs> a tooth damage playing squash. So, but I still keep going. It's addictive. You huh. get all the cardio workout that you'd want and com- combined with a great competitive game. Um, so for anyone that's looking for some new sport to take up, squash would be what I would recommend. Um, but be prepared to have sore knees. That's interesting. That uh, Yeah, and it's funny that it's such a fast-paced, quick twitch sport that you take up in your 40s when we should be doing the opposite, right? Well, I'm not in my 40s anymore. <laughs> But um, I, I really don't know that much about squash other than in the U.S. it's a rich person sport. I think uh, racquetball might be big in, in the States. And racquetball yeah. and squash are kind of sister and brother and sister sports, to be honest with you. They're really, really similar. Okay, so what are the differences? Like, basically, like a squash, it looks like a much bigger court, a much bigger racket, right? Yeah, that's it. But the concept is absolutely the same. It's bigger court, bigger racket, but... um. That. Yeah, that's good. And with squash, I know you're always bragging to me uh, about how you're beating these guys, you know, 20 years <laughs> younger. On. I'm and supposed you know. to be modest and humble, Norm. You're the American. I I would never brag. Yeah, well, it does it it does make me continue to make me feel young. Maybe that and that yeah. might be the the attraction to it because if I'm beating guys that are younger fitter and they must be looking at me going how do, how can this guy beat me he's older he doesn't move as fast so um so maybe that's the love i have for it um but long may it continue all right it's that time again everyone to wrap up the t and mortgage podcast this was episode number four thank you so much for listening and uh for tuning in with me and your host john coleman and from me as well, thank you so much for listening. And as always, any questions, just drop me a line and I'm, I'm here to help.